everybody. Welcome to One of Life. Uh, you guys excited to be here this morning, I hope. Uh, this morning, Shane will be heading back into the sermon series on Bible and race. Uh, a couple announcements with the, you guys this morning. If you're new with us, uh, welcome. Glad you're here, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning, either uh, online or here in person. Uh, parents, if you have not picked one up yet for your kids, there are fun packs at the door with a snack. Um, it definitely beats the fun pads that I had when I was a kid. So, ooh, anybody remember those? <laughs> those are road trips right there. Um, if you, when you're finished, if you just leave the clipboard on the table, that would be great. Uh, last Sunday of this month, August 30th, we're going to be having our first ever Vision Sunday. Uh, it's going to be time of sharing what our church leadership feels God's wanting to do uh, in us as individuals and as a body for this coming year. We're going to spend some time hearing from Shane on what our theme will be for the year, as well as singing and praying a blessing uh, over our different ministries and over the city of Maslin. So I have one service at 10.30 a.m. outside uh, on the property, so we encourage you to bring chairs and something for the shade. I know last time we brought a blanket, and that was great for the kids, so if you have kids, maybe think about that. Um, and as a way to share our appreciation with you, if the year off, we're also going to be having the Kona Shaved Ice Truck, and we'll be providing a treat for you as well. Uh, I encourage you to pack and picnic and enjoy an afternoon outside on the property. I don't know who, if you guys were here for the last one, it was pretty awesome. So. Looking forward to another one. Uh, please come be ready to, to dream and hear what God's heart is for ALCF. Just a reminder, please wear your mask inside the church building at all times, like I'm not doing right now. And outside, if you cannot physically distance yourselves from others, and please don't give handshakes or hugs. You know, air high fives are appropriate. Uh, we want to stress the importance of following these guidelines because we do want to be able to keep meeting in person, and we care about safety. Amen. Lastly, we are continually blessed by everyone who comes alongside the church and partners by giving. Thank you. So during this time, uh, we'll continue to have a giving station that you can put your offering in. And uh, after the service, that are located by the door. You can also give online at www.alcfohio.org at any time. And before we get started, I want to take a moment and pray over the service. So if you guys can bow your heads and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together with our family in Christ. Uh, we are so grateful for this, this chance to get together and meet and to have the freedoms that we have in this nation. Pray that we would honor you with our, our singing and our study this morning. And I give you all the glory for this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm going to read um, a passage, part of a passage of Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand holds me. God, because you are who you are, I will praise. I will bless you. I will lift my hands in worship. I will sing with joy and I will sing to you. Will you stand with me and sing to our great God? Jesus, our Savior. 
Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen.
trust in Him completely, and with every day pour out my soul, and He will prove His mercy.
currently living in, and we've been in Malaysia now for six years. Uh, prior to that, we were serving in the Philippines for 28 years. And uh, so God has blessed that ministry and it's going fine. We'll share about that in a little bit. Uh, we're in Malaysia, we serve in the peninsula of Malaysia. You can go to the next slide. And uh, we, we serve in the peninsula there, but also across the ocean there on the island of uh, Borneo. Uh, there's also ministries going on there in Sabah and Sarawak. But we're in the peninsula serving among the Malay people. Next slide. Uh, so we do a number of different things. We go hiking and, uh, and whatever uh, in order to meet Malays and to share with them. Malays make up 65% of the population and they have to be Muslims. They're, it's illegal for them to hear the gospel, for them to entertain anything about it, to go to a church or to do anything. Now there may be among the Chinese and Indian population of Malaysia, they have their churches and their freedom to worship as you do here. Uh, but for the Malay people, they do not have that. Uh, next slide. Then, uh, so we work in different high schools, and Michelle and I have taught English and things like that to try to meet people and build relationships, go to their weddings, etc. Next slide. And uh, but one of the things we're working on right now, we're calling it Broad Seed. So and what we really have done is made a Facebook page professionally, and uh, we are. Uh, sharing God's Word uh, on the Facebook page, uh, set up a YouTube video pages where the Lumo Project videos are on there, uh, which is uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in, in its entirety in film, and so they can see that and hear that in the Malay language. And so as they come to the Facebook page, we've set on Messenger, uh, there's a chat bot there that will ask them questions, ask them if they want to see a video, hear a story, uh, verses will come to them. Uh, they'll be able to choose if they liked it or not, or how they liked it, or what their comments are about it. They can stop if they also would like to do that. But it will send them automatically things each day. And then we usually jump on uh, uh, most days and get on there and chat with people and things like that as well in the Malay language. I have two partners with this ministry, those that, are, that we're working with. They're both of our disciples. One is from a Malay background, and so he's doing all the chatting. The other one, uh, Nate, is... Uh, he, he's technically inclined, and so he's the one running all the computer stuff. So pray for us now as we continue this broad seed sowing or sharing on Facebook. It allows us to really get the Word of God out there. We can advertise and all that sort of thing as well. And so it's helping share God's Word. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is our Facebook page, at least a few weeks ago. It's changed now again. Uh, but we uh, continue to update that. Next slide. Uh, also, another group of disciples uh, are making this One Nation studio, and so we've been able to upload their things as well. It's really kind of infomercials, cartooning. They've kind of taught themselves how to draw and how to put all this stuff there up on the web, and so we add that to our Facebook page as well. Next. The other thing we're working on now is for the different believers we've been discipling over the years to have them gather together. Uh, we've been discipling some for almost six years since we've been there. Others we've won to Christ. Uh, others we've met along the way. And so we're bringing them through from Genesis all the way to Revelation in the curriculum. Kind of during the COVID, uh, I wrote, uh, well, we had the curriculum written in Filipino languages, but I never had it written in English. So I had to get it in English so that I can get it in Malay. And so we finished up Biblical Eldership, which is a 300 some page book, and then now we uh, done Revelation with all 350 pages as well. And so they can go through and through this curriculum. So our next step is to get it in Malay. So in order to bring these disciples through, uh, we've been able to introduce them at parties together, things like that. But the cost is very high for them to gather. For the Malays, it's highly illegal. For the refugees, if they're caught, and Malays will hunt for them as well. They could be sent back to their country, and especially for those from Yemen. It could be certainly a death sentence for them. And so, they're, but they're willing now to begin to gather. We just met just before we left. We came over here on July 8th. Uh, but just a few couple weeks before we left, we gathered the believers, the leaders together, and uh, they like to begin worshiping together. They will, from the beginning, because we've been discipling them, uh, take over the preaching and teaching and leading of worship and all that sort of thing. Uh, none of them have musical talents, so on the next slide or so, uh, we are having people from other churches train them a bit in music. We don't know any about ourselves, and none of them do anything either. 
And so uh, pray for them as they make a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, next slide. So we've been discipling them. These are just some of our disciples. The one guy there that lives in Chicago now. He got asylum here in the U.S., so I'll see him this week. Um, next slide. Uh, this family is in, uh, from Pakistan. They're from Azada community. And uh, we've been able to help them in order to get out of Malaysia. Uh, they were had been rejected twice. The third rejection was coming from the U.N., and then they would never be able to go anywhere. And so uh, we were able to intervene and help them. And uh, praise God, August 24th, they have their last immunization. And then as soon as Canada opens up their borders, they have the private sponsors there and be able to go there. Uh, she's been a, Yas Ben and her family have been particularly in the next slide as well, uh, very good at sharing Christ with Pakistanis in Malaysia. Uh, and, the, and she came to Christ while we were there as well. Next slide. Uh, we have a number of Yemeni disciples and they've been helping us out. And then the next slide. Uh, this family is uh, Kira and her mother and family. You can go to the next slide. We just pray for them as they have been um, shoved back now to Yemen twice. They're in Yemen currently. They were in Malaysia a couple times. We brought them through Bible studies, got them set up, but then they were forced back because of an evil father. And uh, Kulud has made these different Kira. Yeah, anyway, getting really. But anyway, uh, Kira is uh, fighting for rights of women in the Arab world. They still practice female circumcision. They beat them. They marry them off as young girls. Uh, they have no rights or anything, and so she has made this one picture, and she put the verse to it, look to him and be radiant, so that your faces shall never be ashamed. They need livelihood in that sense, but we're praying that maybe her artwork and her advocacy for Arab women will maybe do both things at one time. We're trying to connect her. She's connected to our daughter-in-law that we're seeing what will happen, but pray that God will help all these different refugees have different situations, and the Malays also are very complicated in their situations uh, because they could be sent to a camp, their kids could be taken away from them if they've come to Christ and believe, and so there's all sorts of difficulties for them. So just pray for, for these different believers as they stand for the Lord. Uh, next slide. Uh, I teach in a local preschool and that sort of thing. Next slide. Uh, different people, we go kayaking with different Malay families and things like that to meet more people. Uh, this particular family is helping them with their marriage. Uh, then, uh, next slide. Uh, so pray for Malaysia as we do the broad seed sowing, as the believers gather together, and just pray for freedom that someday, somehow, a miracle will happen, and that they will have freedom of choice as far as their faith goes in Malaysia. Uh, physically, it doesn't look like that would happen, but uh, God can do miracles, and so pray for them in this way. In the Philippines, I think that's our next slide, uh, things are going very well it's in the Philippines, and that business is really thriving. It's actually doubled because of COVID, and uh, so uh, they've been able to purchase property and camp, and they're building a camp right now, and uh, they gave $250,000 away to missions last year. Uh, it, it is a social enterprise, so it, everything that they make, they give away to missions. Uh, but God is really blessing them. And so we're grateful for our staff and how that business is helping send out the 50 different missionaries that MNK, our churches there, have uh, through about six different language groups that they're sharing the gospel with Muslims. So as we've gone, we left the Philippines in order to force them to do more on their own, and they've always been good at that, uh, and so things are going really well. Uh, our children there, in a sense, our spiritual children are doing better than their parents, so praise God for that. Um, yeah. So, next slide. Yeah, so just pray for our staff and, uh, and the work at the herbal plant and all the Bible studies going on. COVID has also been good for us because people had to stay at home. And we didn't, so our people just went from place to place, from village to village, and taught the Word of God as people were home. So that was a good thing for the churches there in the Philippines. So, yeah, good.
I have a question. So since it's a government mandate, you know, you're all supposed to be Muslim, does that aid you guys in sharing the gospel? Do you run into people that are, they're just culturally, they're not, they're not Muslim. They're atheists or they're agnostic or they just don't believe because it's been shown upon them that they reject that and they're looking for truth. Are they more open to the gospel? Well, Malaysians are, they're, they, they don't have a lot of problems there in the sense that things are kind of just steady. It's not like other nations where there's a lot of terrorism and those kind of things going on. So, and they're not really highly ambitious people. So, they, um, although there are a few that are. So, they're just kind of content. So, it's really new for them. But they've been taught not to listen to Christianity and, and they're told in the mosque and all that kind of stuff. The, the Christians that are in Malaysia are very afraid to share with them. And so, they're just a, uh, not a blank slate, but... Um, we're finding that those from the Middle East and others, because they've seen the evil of Islam, they would be more agnostic and all those kind of things, or even some become atheists. And that's still okay, as long as you don't become a Christian. Uh, but uh, in Malaysia, they're still really holding on to Islam because they haven't really experienced the most evil parts of the religion, I suppose. Yeah. But it, it's really new for them. They've not heard the gospel, and so it's difficult for them. But praise God, we're, we're getting some fruit uh, through the page, and we, we're going to see what God does. Yeah. Is there any curiosity because of the prophet Jesus in Islam that they want to hear more about him? Not, maybe not so much Christianity, but at least the Christian perspective on, on Christ? Uh, sometimes they do, yeah, yeah. And they're curious about it, so we can share with them. And normally we share with them and uh, doing activities with them, whether I'm... Um, helping disabled kids ride horses or we're working in the HIV clinic or whatever else we're doing as we meet people. Uh, through that, normal conversations around the table, they like to eat. Uh, eating is a very, I mean, all cultures love to eat, but um, for Malay people, they don't ask how you do it and things like that. They would say, have you eaten yet? That would be how they say hi. So, um, so Eating with them around the meal is a good opportunity. Do you need help? <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to go on. <laughs> Do you like spicy food? I love spicy. All right, and come on, drink pull up. So, I, I guess my next question would be: What, what do you, like? What is your foot in the door for them? If they're Muslim and they're really not ambitious, and they don't have a, a cultural rejection of what's been instituted upon them. Like, what is what's the best foot in the door you found? Uh, I think, you know, like with anybody, I think making friends with people uh, it helps to learn the language. We've been able to speak Malay now with them. Uh, it's easier to learn language. It was harder in the Philippines, but we were immersed in the mountains, so it was easier to learn. I'm pretty, I'm good in the Malay language, still learning, but that really helps. Having, you know, being a Caucasian, but knowing their language uh, really helps bridge that gap. And then I'll ask questions, and so your first conversations with people are usually pretty healthy. It's trying to get the second, third, fourth, or a regular Bible study going that's more difficult. And that's just basically relationship building. Yeah, just for that, like anywhere else, just making friends and helping them. I mean, they can hear the gospel, but they also have to see it in your life as well. To, to, and they will notice differences of how we are, how we love one another, how we can trust one another. In the Malay culture, there's a lot of witchcraft, a lot of cursing. They're really afraid of all these different spirits and things like that, and they curse one another. And so, to have us love other people and help one of people, that's very appealing to them. And so they're curious about that. Awesome. Well, um, there are a couple slides back there was like the list of things that, that we could be praying for. Can we do that now? Sure. Would you like to lead us in that person since it's you guys? Is, sure. That's it. Amen. <laughs> Father in heaven, we're grateful for this fellowship and we pray and thank you for Pastor Shane and we thank you, God, for the ministry here and the elders and what you're doing. We, we do pray that you'll bless us. We pray for our own country here in the United States and as things are difficult with racial tensions and other things, we pray that you help us listen to the message this morning and, and see how we can love people that are unlike us. 
We're grateful, Father, for this church, for the picnic tables across the way and, and all the people and the way that they bless uh, this community on a regular basis. And just thank you for their, their bridging the gap and showing love to others. Uh, we do pray that you help us to do the same in Malaysia. We ask God that you'll bring freedom of faith, that the Malays will be able to hear the gospel as we sow the word of God broadly by using <coughs> social media. We ask God that you'll help us to find those that are open, those like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 that was praying and you spoke to them in their hearts. And so we pray that you'll do that with many Malays and pray that uh, Sean's desire, our desire, that you'll plant many churches among them, house churches, Throughout the peninsula for your glory. Bless our co workers as they get their visas. Help us to get back in the country this next month. And uh, we just pray, dear Father, that you help those that are refugees. And we know that each and every situation is different in what they need and what you want to do. Uh, we thank you, dear God, that we have a future and a hope in Christ. We pray that they would also have that here in this world to a certain extent. But we pray that most of all they would put the kingdom of heaven kingdom of God first above all other things and share your word with others. Thank you for your blessing of the projects in the Philippines and for the herbal business and for the churches that are being planted and the different people groups hearing the word of God for the medical team that's doing outreach and, and through the COVID crisis and all the Bible studies that have happened uh, in the local churches area in the neighborhoods because no one could travel very far and yet they use that to spread God's word. Help us to do that here in Ohio and help us to do that around the world. Thank you for the partnership of this church. and We've been serving together for 35 good years. And uh, we're grateful, Father, for uh, the new ones that are here and those that have been here a long time. For each and every one of us in the body of Christ, it's a privilege to serve together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, was telling the, the group over at Demers, I'm so thankful for people like Tom and Michelle O'Brien. And as I was singing the songs over there, like I was um, just overwhelmed with the beauty of Christ. Like just how loving and amazing He is. And then that He puts it on people's hearts like Tom and Michelle to go into difficult places far away from home uh, to love people. And... I am so grateful that we are making an impact. This church here in Maslin, Ohio, is making an impact in Malaysia simply because we are partnered with Tom and Michelle. So it's, it's just awesome to be in partnership with you. I did not realize it was 35 years. I know I knew it was a long time. Didn't realize it was that long. That's awesome. Um, this week is just a, it's just a different week, I think, for, for people in our church. Um, obviously, we still have the pandemic stuff going on. There's still the racial stuff going on. And we're going to be speaking about the race stuff because I think it's so important that we're clear on what God's word has to say about this very hot button issue. And we want to be thinking the way God thinks about race and racial injustice. Um, but it's also an additional, just strange week, because uh, one of our dearly beloved brothers has went to be with Jesus, Ed Hodgson. So he was a part of this congregation from the beginning. That's what I understand. And so he's been worshiping here at this church for 40 or so years. And so it's just bizarre. As I was singing you know, the songs over there, it was just weird for me to sing and know that Ed is no longer you know, here uh, with us, but yet at the same time just rejoicing that he's no longer suffering and he is finally with his beloved Savior. But it's just weird and strange. It just is. We were not meant, we were not created to die. And so it's always <coughs> difficult. Uh, so let's make sure to pray for Sharon as she starts this new chapter of her life. And uh, before I got up to preach over at the other building, one of my sons said, short and sweet, as I was getting up. 
So I will try and make this message as short and as sweet as I possibly can. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can be together. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the cooler weather and what a refreshing thing it is to be sitting in here and feeling that cooler air come in. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of the, the peaks and the valleys and your faithfulness never stops. And your love is an unfailing, unceasing love. Lord, we are grateful that Ed is with you, broke down body, suffering under the weight of illness. Um, and yet, we are sad, and we, are, we grieve, and we really feel for Sharon, as she was starting a totally different chapter in her life. And we pray uh, for your sustaining grace for her that she would experience that your mercies truly are new each morning. And we pray also that this church body uh, would rally around her and that family and friends would continue to minister to her in the weeks and months and years to come. Lord, thank you that uh, you've made people, all people in your image, and that no race of people has more inherent worth or dignity than another. Lord, I pray that we could be bearers of light when it comes to this, this discussion of race and racial injustice and systemic racism, that we would think your thoughts in regards to this issue. Holy Spirit, teach us, uh, enlighten us. Uh, we, love, we love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the way I am thinking about the sermon series, and hopefully this will make sense to you, I'm giving you a window into my mind and how this is structured. Hopefully it's helpful, but uh, I'm looking, what I'm doing with you is I'm looking at the overarching storyline of the Bible. And as we look at the major sections of that storyline, what can we learn about race and what God thinks of race and racism? So there's, a, there's a several different ways you can break up the main storyline of the Bible, but one popular way, and this is the way that I'm using, is creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Two Sundays ago when we started the sermon series, we looked at creation and fall, those two major sections of the biblical storyline. And we looked at, well, what does creation and fall teach us about racism? If you haven't listened to that sermon two, two Sundays ago, I encourage you to do it. I also encourage you to listen to Justin's last Sunday, because I think he did a phenomenal job, and what he shared really ties in to what we're talking about in the sermon series. Today, what I want to do is I want to focus on the redemption section of the storyline of the Bible. And it's the major section, the most major of the major sections, because the vast majority of the Bible is dealing with the redemption um, section. And I think that re the redemption section can be divided into some subsections. Israel, the prophet, Jesus, and the church. And so this morning, we are going to look at the major section of redemption, specifically though the subsection of Israel that's under that umbrella. So hopefully that makes sense. And the first thing that I want to tell you, because I want you to be equipped, if somebody comes to you and says that the Bible supports um, superiority of race or racism or systemic racism, I want you to be well equipped in humility and love to, to point them to how the scriptures denounce that sort of thing. And the first thing I want you to see in regards to Israel is that Israel was an ethnically diverse group from its, very, from its inception, from the very beginning. After the fall recorded in Genesis 3, God, he picks this guy named Abraham, and he tells Abraham, look, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your family great, and through you, I am going to bless all the people of the earth. Now, if you fast forward the biblical storyline, um, you get to the book of Exodus. 
And in Exodus, what we find is God's promise to Abraham really beginning to materialize because uh, his descendants really become numerous. So numerous, in fact, that the Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, and other Egyptians are concerned that Abraham's family is getting so large that they're going to take over power. And so in order to continue to keep Abraham's family in their place, the Egyptians enslave Abraham's family, which becomes known as the, the Israelites. And of course, God, if you're reading the storyline, he hears the cry of the Israelite people. And so he saves them. And as they're coming out of slavery in Egypt, as they're leaving Egypt, there's one really important verse that we need to see in that story. So it's Exodus 12, 37 through 38, and the really important verse is verse 38. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sakoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children. Check this part out. And a mixed multitude went up with them also in flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. A mixed multitude went up with them also. Scholars will tell you that the Hebrew word behind mixed here in this verse means ethnically diverse. Various different people groups. And that means that it wasn't just the biological descendants of Abraham that were saved out of Egypt, but it, there were a ton of non-Israelite people that God also saved that weren't biological descendants of Abraham. And if you look at the Egyptian literary records, we, we learn who some of these people groups were. Um, Canaanites, Amorites, Arameans, and the list goes on. Where the, that was, these different ethnicities were some of the ethnicities that were a part of that mixed multitude. What's I think very interesting for us living in America is that those Egyptian literary records also tell us that there were a ton of Kushites living in Egypt. Kushites were black African people. And the reason why there were a ton of them living in Egypt is because what, Egypt was a world superpower. And when they would conquer people groups, they would bring those conquered people back to Egypt to be slaves and servants and so on and so forth. And so part of that mixed multitude were black Africans that God saved from slavery in Egypt. I don't know about you, but when, over the years, as I have thought about Israel, I haven't, I don't think, fully understood the extent to which they were a mixed multitude of ethnicities. I just always thought of Israel as like Israelites, like descendants of Abraham. But from the very beginning, it was not the case. There, it was very mixed. And so Israel was more of a theological community than a biological community. And what I mean by this is that um, the people, it was more centered around the worship of Yahweh than it was around, which is the God of the Bible, than it was about around color of skin or ethnicity. It was a theological community, not necessarily a biological community. Another thing I want to point out in regards to the Exodus is that strangers were included in Passover. If you don't know what Passover was, it was the main event that brought the, the, the Israelites and the mixed multitude of other ethnicities that were with the Israelite people out of Egypt. And what God uh, instructed the Israelite males to do was to kill a lamb, uh, eat that lamb with their family, put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their household, and then when God's judgment fell on all people living in Egypt, uh, they would be passed over. They would be passed over. That If they took shelter under the blood of the lamb, um, their firstborn son would not be killed. And in the instructions that God gave the Israelite people, Look at how he includes the strangers in his instructions. 
Exodus 12, 43 through 49 says, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Now right now it looks like, all right, only Israelites, biological descendants of Abraham, can eat this Passover and be included in the Exodus. But then we read in 48, And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. This passage is the, uh, you know, making a distinction between stranger, uh, uh, foreigners and aliens who do not worship Yahweh and are dwelling with the Israelite community and those that do. And the ones that worship Yahweh, they can partake in Passover and they can be part of the exodus and experience the salvation of God. Here's another thing. So when, if you follow this biblical storyline, you continue with Israel. So God rescues uh, the Israelite and this mixed multitude of people out of Egypt. They essentially, they become a nation and God gives them laws to govern their life by, right? And here's what we find, and I don't even think this is in your PowerPoint because it was a late edition. But here it is. God commanded the Israelites to love the foreigners dwelling in their midst. Leviticus 19.33 says this, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. You were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And if that's not clear enough, God states, the scriptures state in Deuteronomy 27.19, Cursed is the one who perverts the justice to the stranger, the fatherless, and widow. And all the peoples, all the people shall say amen. Amen? Amen. 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 What's more, Moses, one of the key figures of the Old Testament, arguably the, the greatest figure, the most important figure, married a black African woman. So check this out. Um, got Israel, the nation of Israel, out of Egypt. And in the 12th chapter of the book of Numbers, we find Moses marrying a black woman. And it's interesting to compare Moses' siblings' response to this marriage and God's. So check this out. Numbers 12, 1 says this. Then Miriam and Aaron, this is uh, Moses' Moses' sibling spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now some translations say Cushite woman. Well, Cushite, Ethiopian, they're synonymous terms and they mean black African. So you could read this verse this way. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the black African woman who he had married. For he had married a black African woman. Why is this verse telling you twice that he married a black African woman? That's because that was the issue that Miriam and Aaron were having. Now, contrast this with God's response um, to Moses' marriage and uh, Miriam and Aaron's response. Check this out, Numbers 12, 4 through 13. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. See, the Lord is talking Moses up. Check this out. I... Uh, uh, so, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then, Miriam and Aaron, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. 
and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O oh God, I pray. God's response to Miriam and Aaron's response to Moses' marriage to a black African woman clearly shows that God had no problem with it at all. And the punishment that came upon Miriam and Aaron shows that he detested their attitude towards the marriage. The next thing I want to point out, and I've already said it, but it's good to actually make it an official point, is this. God's restriction um, on marrying foreigners, because you may be thinking, all right, I've read the Old Testament, and God does restrict you know, the, his nation of Israel, the people in it, from, in it, from marrying foreign people. Um, and so this is another point. God's restrictions on marrying foreigners but it was not ethnically based, but theologically based. So God prohibited, he prohibited the, the people living in, his, in the nation of Israel from marrying the inhabitants specifically of the land of, inhabiting the land of Canaan. That's who he prohibited. It wasn't just foreigners in general. And secondly... It was, again, for theological reasons and not for ethnic reasons. The reason why God, he, he had this command, uh, don't intermarry with the people living in Canaan, is because he knows, and, I, and if we had time, I'd read the passage, Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. He knew if they did, it would draw the hearts of the men in Israel away from him, the worship of him. That's why he said don't intermarry. It wasn't because of their color of skin, their race, their ethnicity. In fact, the Canaanites most resembled the Israelites in physical appearance. So it wasn't because of that. The last thing I want to tell you, if you look at the nation of Israel, is that uh, King David, some of his greatest supporters were non-Israelite people. Um, if you, unfortunately, if you follow the storyline of the Bible and of Israel, Israel, in fact, does become quite the kingdom of, under the leadership of King David. Unfortunately, there were a lot of problems that kept them from really being the light that God intended them to be to other nations. Uh, one problem that arose for Israel is that King David's son, Absalom, wanted to kill David and take his throne. And during that time, many of the people that made up Israel started to follow Absalom instead of David. And in this time, the ones that supported probably David, some of, the, some of his greatest supporters were foreigners. Just check this out. In 2 Samuel 8, 18 and 15, 18, we find that there are non-Israelites that make up David's personal bodyguard. <clears throat> if you read the list of David's mighty men in 2 Samuel 23, that list includes at least three foreigners. 2 Samuel 8, 9 through 18 mentions a Cushite. And again, a Cushite was a black African. And this Cushite was trusted by King David's general, Joab, to spread the news that King David had won the victory over Absalom. And so you have this black African playing this really important role, this black African soldier playing a really important role in King David's um, uh, kingdom. And so if you, if you add this with what we learned in Genesis, all people made in the image of God, and so nobody has, no race has more dignity or inherent worth in another race. If you add to it, you know, Genesis 3 in the fall, and the reason we have racism is because 
We as people wanted to be Lord in place of God, and we want to be superior to other people, and that's where it all stems from. And then you, you add on to that Genesis 12 where, where God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you great, and I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to all peoples of the earth. And if, then if you follow the storyline as we have into Israel, and you see that Israel was an ethnically diverse group from the beginning. Strangers were included in Passover. God's commands to love the foreigner and the stranger and as with the same intensity by which you love yourself. Moses, one of the key figures, marrying a black African woman. Um, God uh, only excluding people if they're not willing to worship him, not on race at all. If you add this all together... And it's just become so clear that God abhors racism. And he truly is for all people and desires all people to be saved and to come and worship him. Amen. I just want you to have this kind of information so that you can see it. And so that if anybody comes to you and says, oh, no, here's some, some verses, you can say, oh, no, here's some, uh, here's some, this is what this is really saying, so... Um, pray with me, and uh, I'll let you, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go here in just a bit. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for how clear it is in your word that you value all people, that you made all people in your image, and your desire is to rescue all people from the greatest um, slave master, and that is sin. Lord, thank you that your invitation extends to all who will come and repent and place their trust in you as Lord and Savior. Um, Lord, I don't understand how people not too long ago in our country enslaved thousands and thousands of African people. It just breaks my heart to think that they used the Bible um, to support um, so, something that so is against you and your ways. Lord, I pray that as we navigate this very divisive time in our nation's history, um, that we could be bearers of the truth, that everybody is inherently equal in worth and dignity and honor and value. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.